I have the privilege of starting us off in introducing Justin Reich, who started his career as a high school history teacher. He has a, a doctorate from the, um, oh, I lost my screen with all my info on it, not good. Doctorate from the Harvard Graduate School of Education and is currently an associate professor of digital media at MIT. He has written, in addition to all of the usual academic publications, has been published in Science, The Washington Post, and The Atlantic. I would strongly encourage you to follow him on Twitter, including continuing adventures with the Ski Patrol that are interesting, as well as really significant content, including just yesterday, I think it was, some really interesting survey data about uh, parents' perceptions of schools' response to COVID. He's also currently director of MIT's Teaching Systems Lab, which is how I have uh, become familiar with him. And I have been so impressed with the skill set that he has brought to managing that lab. And I don't want to take up any more time, so I will turn it over to Justin. Well, thanks for the introduction, Julie. We've been super fortunate to have Julie working with us uh, this year. She's been a really terrific contributor to uh, a project that we uh, have to broaden participation in computing uh, in Massachusetts by partnering districts there. Uh, so I'm very glad to be able to um, chat with some of her uh, terrific colleagues and, and get to know some of all of you. Um, yeah, so my name is Justin Reich. Uh, 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 the, in September of 2020, um, I published a book called Failure to Disrupt, Why Technology Alone Can't Transform Education. Um, the, it was kind of an incredible time to be releasing a book on the topic in March of 2020. Um, you know, literally as schools were just beginning to shut down was when uh, the page proofs of the book uh, came across my desk. Uh, and I, I distinctly remember sitting at my desk trying to think to myself, man, is everything that we've learned about the history of education technology going to somehow seem different um, six months from now when, when the world gets transformed by the pandemic? Uh, and, and, you know, is there anything that's in this book that's just going to seem really stupid once the pandemic gets going? And I'm glad to say we didn't change anything. Um, and, uh, and I think it's held up pretty well uh, as one of the really the sort of crucial themes of the book is that there's a lot about the history of education technology that can tell us about what the future is going to look like. Um, so maybe I'll share some of these ideas for, for half an hour, 40 minutes. People should feel free to jump in if they like, and then we'll save some time for, for back and forth and discussion. Um, so part of what inspires the book um, is for the last two decades, uh, education technologists have made some really extraordinary claims about how new technologies are gonna transform teaching and learning. Um, in 2009, there was a book by Clay Christensen, the professor at Harvard Business School. Um, and he said that by 2019, half of all secondary school classes in the United States would be online. They would cost a third as much to provision as they cost now, and they would have better learning outcomes um, than, than the in-person courses that are typically offered. Um, Sebastian Thrun, a Google engineer who founded Udacity um, in the midst of MOOC mania said, uh, you know, in, in 50 years, there might only be 10 institutions of higher education in the world producing content. There might be other places that are, you know, facilitating students and offering recitations and things like that. But there's really just going to be 10 distributors of teaching and learning in higher education, and Udacity might be one of them. Um, in 2011, Sal Khan uh, gave a TED talk called Let's Use Video to Reinvent Education. And his vision was that uh, during a substantial part of their learning, students would sit individually in front of laptops um, watching uh, videos and doing practice problems and exercises that presented a topic to them in some kind of algorithmically optimized pace. And then periodically teachers would grab small groups of students for projects or remediation or other kinds of things. Um, but this sort of algorithmically driven learning experience that students would have. Um, and then in some respects, the most radical of all this fellow is Sugata Mitra, um, who won the 2013 TED Prize. Um, who uh, uh, gave a keynote at the Learning at Scale conference a number of years ago, um, where he said, you don't even need schools um, or any of these other institutions that these other people are talking about. Um, if you just give groups of children access to the internet and laptops, they can really teach anything by themselves. Um, for those of you over the last two years who have spent a bunch of time at home with children not in school, you can probably confirm that Dr. Mitra is wrong and that groups of students with laptops cannot teach anything to themselves um, by themselves. So um, 
you know, after after a decade or two of these pronouncements, the world two years ago uh, faced this horrific pandemic. And, and one of the ways you could frame the pandemic is that to some extent it made the job of or the or the promises of these education technologists even easier to achieve. Because remember, their sort of original claim is that new technologies can drive these profound changes that make um, a, a new education system much better than the existing education system. But for the past two years, you haven't even had to do that. You only have to produce learning environments that are better than a pandemic hobbled, staffing shortage stretched, um, you know, in, in many ways really injured, pandemic inflected um, education system. And I think uh, there's, there's in some respects been a, been a in, sec, in, in primary and secondary education, um, a, a really profound public shift uh, about online learning where, where for the vast majority of people who had to do emergency remote learning, their experience was somewhere between disappointing and disastrous. Um, it wasn't. It wasn't everyone. Um, there's actually, a, you know, probably a much smaller group of learners that discovered over the last two years that they think online learning is great, um, works well for them, maybe works better than in-person school. Um, but for for a lot of folks, they found the the remote and hybrid parts of the last couple of years really very challenging. Um, if you read, I hope that readers of Failure to Disrupt um, take away two really important, frequent themes. Um, if you look back at the last, you know, 30 years of education technology with personal computers, if you look back at the last 60 years of education technology with some form of computer, I mean, you know, a striking thing about the history of education technology is that, you know, from the moment we've had mainframe computers that are the size of your living room, from the sort of dawn of the computing era, computer scientists and learning scientists have partnered together to try to create learning experiences for people with technology. I mean, it's just one of the, the, the oldest enterprises that computer scientists have participated in. And, and these two findings come up over and over again. Um, and I think if you were to have used these two findings um, to make predictions about how the pandemic unfolded, uh, they would have served you pretty well. When teachers get access to new technologies, they, the, fir the first intuition they have is to use them to do the kinds of things they were doing before, to use them to extend existing systems. Um, it is possible with time, with training, with support, with coaching for teachers to figure out transformative things, really different kinds of things to do with computers, but there are very, very few settings um, we're doing something different with technology is an educator's first instinct. You know, one way to summarize what happened in higher education in spring of 2020, uh, you know, in the places where the pandemic was still affecting higher education in, in 2020, 2021, um, it's that, you know, teachers walked away from their lecterns and they sat down in front of their home office webcams and they kept teaching roughly the way they were doing before. Um, and there would have been all kinds of folks, instructional designers, learning scientists who said, whoa, um, if you're going to have a fully distance education course, you don't really design those courses the way you do in in-person class. Like there's all kinds of different affordances that technology have that gives you new kinds of options. Um, but that's not the direction the vast majority of educators uh, went in when they transitioned to online. Um, and then a second big theme from the history of education technology is where there is beneficial innovative new practice with education technology, it disproportionately benefits the affluent. There are, is a constant drumbeat of hope um, that new technologies will quote unquote democratize education, that they will disproportionately benefit the students who are furthest from opportunity. Um, and there's really not, a, the, the evidence that that happens is far, far rarer that the evidence that new tools, new opportunities, new advantages of technology are really afforded to those with the financial, social, technical capital to take advantage of new innovations. Um, you know, uh, for, for students in private schools where every family has reliable broadband internet, where, you know, every student has access to their own unique technology device, you know, adding remote learning to the suite of learning modalities that schools has, you know, can, can range from pretty great to at least fine. Um, some of the places where remote emergency learning really fell most flat were in the, in the broadband deserts that exist in our rural areas and our urban areas. 
um, where you know the the potential advantages of of virtual learning you know can only accrue to the people who have the resources to take advantage of them. Um, what actually happened in classrooms over the last uh, few years during the periods where they shifted to remote and hybrid learning? Um, did they take advantage of cutting edge technologies like MOOCs, like artificial intelligence, like virtual reality, um, you know, AI coaches, learning analytics, any of that kind of stuff? For the most part, no. Um, it, I don't think there's really good, you know, clear, robust evidence around this yet. Um, for all that we know, we, you know, for whatever reason during the pandemic, People have been really excited to study test scores and really excited to study opening and closing policies. There have been far fewer people, fewer people who have been interested in the question like, what teaching and learning is actually happening inside schools? Um, we've done a bunch of work on that. We've interviewed about 100 teachers across the country. We had about 250 teachers interview about 5,000 of their students and give us some feedback. We've done some design exercises with multi-stakeholder groups of folks. Um, and our observation is that sort of the two key technologies of the pandemic are two of our very oldest technologies. Um, the first key technology are learning management systems, things like Google Classroom, Canvas Schoolology. Um, these are not that dissimilar from the folder that my elementary school daughter has in her backpack, which has two home on one side and two school on the other. Um, there's all kinds of things learning management systems can do, but they're mostly used to pass documents back and forth between teachers and students. And then the second key technology of the pandemic, um, when it was introduced in the 1930s, was called video telephony. Um, and we call it video conferencing now, things like Zoom and Teams and Hangouts and all these things that we're all too familiar with. Um, and their signature, you know, nominally they let, um, you know, something like uh, you can see and hear a speaker while the speaker can see and hear the other people in the room, or at least a selection of them. Um, you know, in reality, teaching through Zoom is a little bit like teaching through a keyhole. Um, you can kind of, with some awkward straining, hear and see what's happening on the other side, but it's not really conducive to, to meaningful conversation. Um, but the sort of signature virtue of these two technologies um, is that they were well established, they were reasonably familiar to audiences, and schools could use them to kind of recreate a sort of kabuki version of in-person schooling. Um, there are very few schools across the country over the last two years that have used remote learning to really rethink any of their organizational modes, any of the grammar of schooling. There are a handful of secondary schools during the mostly remote year that went from year long courses to semester long courses. So instead of taking six courses a year, you took three courses a semester. Um, and, and the reason for that is to have there be sort of fewer needed points of contact between teachers and students sort of simplify some of those connections. But overwhelming, you know, one of the great paradoxes of the pandemic is that at extraordinary expense with hours and hours of extra effort, with many, many late nights and weekends, teachers basically used education technology to just recreate the schools that we had in person online. Um, we will never in our lifetimes, I believe, see a more powerful demonstration of the conservatism of educational systems. Um, you know, a, a profound set of social changes, sort of urgent social need. We have to completely reproduce the educational system. And to some extent, we build the one that we already had. Um, you know, a second, I think, crucial pandemic is that in, in, despite the fact the outcome looks so much like what we started with, educators showed tremendous capacity for change. Um, you know, what we, we interviewed a group of, of teachers in Madison, Wisconsin, and one of their reflections on the pandemic was, you know, we now know how to change. Um, we've been changing every three weeks. You know, there's so many things in schools that seemed fixed, that seemed permanent, that seemed like they sort of had to be that way. And we discover that so many of those things are plastic and malleable and changeable. Um, but there becomes a second pan paradox that we also face that teachers have this tremendous capacity to change and everyone else is really, really tired. Um, there's, there's not a whole lot of reinventing of schools that's gonna happen in the next six months or in the next year. Um, a, a, a challenge that education leaders have in the years ahead is to figure out how to take all the, the, the energy and capacity for change that we discovered um, and apply it in what we hope are, are more normal times ahead. Um, 
So the pandemic did not reveal a sort of profound shift, a disruption, a sort of sweeping away of, um, of the old education system with new technologies. Um, and you know, one of the hearts, the, the heart of the argument of failure to disrupt is that if you really want to understand the, the future of schooling and the future of technology of schooling, it's important to understand the past. Um, there are some sort of education technology evangelists who have started over the last couple of years to change their thinking somewhat about how much change we can expect technology to drive in education. Millions of people have watched uh, Sal Khan's TED Talks. Far fewer have read his January 2019 interview in District Administration Magazine, um, this little trade magazine for school superintendents. Where he gave an interview, you know, one of the things about South, he, he formed this thing called Khan Academy, um, which is a set of online videos and online practice problems, but he also created an in-person school called the Khan Lab School. Um, and it cost, you know, $30,000 a year or something like that to go there. And it was meant to be the sort of laboratory where he was going to bring um, his ideas to life in a school that he had total control over. And in this interview, he says, you know, uh, one thing that we've learned is that compared to how it sounds, um, Theoretically, it's really not, it's not that easy to bring these ideas of educational transformation disruption uh, uh, to light. Um, and in fact, he starts talking about how rather than trying to build these sort of fully algorithmically optimized systems for students, you know, more recently we're seeing that if students put 30 minutes to an hour, one class period a week towards software-based self-paced learning schools, we'll see a 20 to 30 percent greater than expected gain on state assessments. Um, you know, the best of both worlds. You get you'll you'll keep doing most of what you're doing, um, but with this extra 30 to 60 minutes of practice problems, you get much better results. Now, when I read that, it sort of st stuck out at me because um, I thought, I, you know, I feel like I've heard these kinds of arguments before. Um, and indeed, it's very, very similar to what folks at Carnegie Mellon University were writing about in the 1990s, where they built these tools called cognitive tutors. They brought them into the Pittsburgh school system. They tried to get teachers to teach sort of regular math three days a week and then to do um, uh, the cognitive tutors two days a week. They could really only get one day a week out of the teachers. Um, and uh, so, that, you know, four days of regular instruction, one days of computer-based practice problems, and you get a little bump um, in your standardized test scores at the end of the year. Um, one way that you could sort of understand these findings is that the kinds of things that Khan Academy has discovered with $150 million of philanthropic investment over 10 years, they could have figured out uh, with a trip to the library um, to read some of the things that have already been published. Uh, as the as the great folk singer Utah Phillips uh, says, the past didn't go anywhere. Now did it? I can go outside and pick up a rock that's older than the oldest song you know, and come back in here and drop it on your foot. Um, the past didn't go anywhere. Um, my colleague uh, in the UC system, Morgan Ames, wrote a terrific book about the one laptop per child program called uh, the Charisma Machine, where she proposes these two stances that folks can take towards education technology. One is the charismatic stance. And this is the idea that technology disrupts and transforms existing systems, that the future will be brand new and different because of new technology. This is sort of what Sal Khan circa 2011 sounded like. She contrasts that with what she calls the tinkering stance, which is drawn from this great book by uh, David Tyack and Larry Cuban called Tinkering Towards Utopia. Um, and this is more the stance of uh, Sal Khan in 2019, um, which is that new technologies don't disrupt educational systems. New technologies are domesticated by existing educational system. Educational systems look at new technologies and say, you go there. Um, you're not going to transform our schools into some individually uh, algorithmically optimized pathway, but you might be useful for doing practice problems one day a week. Um, if you think descriptively that this kind of tinkering stance is the one where, where we actually see some kinds of results and, and change slowly over time, um, then it's useful to recognize that the future is not going to be brand new and different because of new technology. The future is going to be an extension of trends from history. And technology can make schools better, but it doesn't make schools better by sweeping away the past and bringing in this brand new future. Um, it, make schools better by creating tools that can be fit and slotted into different parts of the educational system. And it really can only be as effective as the communities 
who guide the use of these technologies, that really helping schools get better with technology is not just a matter of you know, dropping laptops from the sky, but building the capacity of teachers, of students, of school leaders, of families to integrate technology in new and interesting ways in schools. You know, two of the sort of key ideas which I think education technology enthusiasts have, have misunderstood throughout the pandemic and before is that folks who describe disruptive technologies, they, they often try to describe technologies that are like Swiss army knives that can do anything or like bulldozers that sort of sweep everything away. But our education technologies are better understood as like very distinctly shaped pegs in sort of a sea of differently shaped holes. Um, our technologies are good in certain contexts for certain subjects, for certain students, and not for others. And so, you know, when we build new tools, they can be helpful, but they're rarely helpful at doing everything. They're usually most helpful at doing something. Um, and you can't make these technologies work just by downloading them onto machines. They're not like switches that you flip on and off. Um, they're only as powerful, they're only as effective as the communities that guide their use. Um, so to some extent, failure to disrupt is a, a celebration of the tinkering mindset. It's a handbook for thinking through technology um, through a tinkerer's mindset saying, we can use technology to improve schools, um, but it's not gonna look like disruptive sweeping change. It's gonna look like consistent cumulative stepwise change. You know, maybe, um, you know, as my colleague Ken Kaninger says, uh, uh, disruptive change is what 25 years of incremental change looks like from a distance. So if you want to try to make um, schools better, in my view, you got to sort of do two things. You have to be able to look at new technologies and understand a little bit about where they come from um, and use your knowledge of the past to figure out how they might be helpful. And that's what the first half of the book tries to do. Um, and then the second half of the book looks at the kinds of challenges and obstacles and dilemmas that have consistently bedeviled education technologists and people who are working to implement new technologies and to say, you know, these are sort of the grand challenges for education technology for our era um, and the extent to which we make improvements against these challenges is going to define how much progress we ultimately make. So as people are thinking about new technologies, the, the question that I ask people to start with is what's new? Um, human beings have been partnering with computers to teach people for 60 years. There are not a lot of brand new, unheard of ideas out there. Every education technology entrepreneur tries to pitch their thing um, as, a, as a disruptive sweeping change. Um, but if you, you know, if you pop open the hood of those shiny new vehicles, you know, you'll find a pretty old internal combustion engine of one form or another underneath. You'll find that the chassis is one that we've used for a long time. Um, one way that I help people in the book sort through these ideas of, of understanding the past of education technology is to say there's really sort of three kinds of large scale learning technologies that we've created. And you can figure out what something is by asking the question, who guides the sequence of learning activities? Is there an instructor who lays out a sort of linear sequence of things for people to do? Um, that would be then an instructor guided learning at scale. That's things like massive open online courses. Does an algorithm um, find some way to assess the performance of a learner and then based on their assessment, um, serve them up some easier, some harder, some different learning experience? That's kind of algorithm guided learning at scale. Um, things like cognitive tutors, intelligent tutors, those sorts of things? Or does the learning sequence get determined by a community of people who share resources and put them together for, for each other in different kinds of ways? That kind of peer guided learning at scale, like you might find in the Scratch programming language and community or in the original connectivist MOOCs. Um, if you can identify a new thing as fitting into one of these three categories, then you can start recognizing like, they probably adopt some pretty well understood pedagogies. I mean, to a first approximation, we basically have two ideas about how to teach people. Um, we think that people are like buckets and you fill their bucket with stuff um, through direct instruction from experts. Or we imagine, um, you know, people as apprentices that need to be inspired to explore environments and figure out things on their own with some guidance from a you know, a, a guide on the side kind of environment. You know, Plutarch 2000 years ago said, uh, um, 
education is not the kindling, uh, it's not the filling of a pail, but the kindling of a flame. Um, and I don't know if he was right about that statement, but he did frame kind of the central debate that we've had for 2000 years in teaching and learning. So, you know, instructor guided uh, learning at scale kinds of things like massive open online courses, self-paced online, uh, online courses, they tend to have this sort of direct instruction pedagogy behind them. And they actually pretty much all have the same sort of basic pedagogical foundations. They have a learning management system, which we you know, developed in the 1960s and 70s, commercialized in the 1990s, made open source in the 2000s. And then they have auto graders to evaluate people's performance um, uh, so that learners can get some feedback about how they're doing as they're going along. There's algorithm guided at scale, which also has this sort of direct instruction approach, but instead of having a learning management system that sequences everything the same way for everyone, it uses this statistical toolkit from the 1980s uh, developed by education testing services called item response theory, which is basically how you can tell whether or not an item is easier or harder than another item. And that's what lets you sort of dynamically assign harder things to people who need more challenge and easier things to people who need less challenge. Um, there was a company called Newton for a while um, that was uh, offering a kind of, uh, you know, algorithmic uh, um, distribution of learning objects as a service. So a publisher would sort of pour their um, content into Newton and Newton would serve it up with sort of an algorithmic back end. And um, the, the founder, Jose Ferrer, was sort of, you know, a ridiculous guy who talked about, um, you know, the... the Newton being a robot tutor in the sky that had millions and millions of data points about every student who came through and knew what they knew and what they were doing and all these kinds of things. Um, and then, you know, Newton engineers were writing blog posts that were things like how we use two parameter item response theory models to make Newton work. You know, <laughs> like, here's how we use this 1980s toolkit to, to power Newton. Um, what's Part of what I want to do with the book is sort of demystify the technologies that we have and say that, you know, there's some neat things that entrepreneurs and designers are doing out there. But a lot of what we do in education technology is reusing some of these key components over and over again. Um, peer guided learning at scale also has a similar kind of technological foundation um, of systems that operate on the open web and have aggregators that connect people to one another. These kinds of technologies tend to be the more sort of Dewey centered apprenticeship focused kinds of, uh, kinds of approaches. The other things about the technologies in each of these categories is that we have research on all of them and we you know, increasingly sort of understand where they work and where they don't. So instructor guided learning at scale works really well, but it mostly works for already educated, already affluent people. Um, most folks don't do particularly well at self-guided independent learning. And the ones that do tend to be the people who've already had a really good apprenticeship in the formal educational system. So MOOCs are great for helping people earn their second master's degree. They're not really so good at onboarding new people into higher education. Um, Instructor uh, algorithm guided learning at scale has some pretty good proof points, but only in a handful of subject areas. It works pretty well in stuff that we can automatically test. So in certain components of math, in the early years of language acquisition, but not the later years of language acquisition, in computer programming, um, although again, only certain parts of computer programming, not others. In the places it works, it works really well. Um, it doesn't work nearly as well in domains where we have to evaluate people's ability to reason from evidence, especially in writing or in unstructured text, um, which is unfortunate because the main thing we do in higher education systems is to teach people how to reason from evidence. Um, so it's like pretty useful, but only in certain kinds of domains and places. And then lots of people have really powerful experiences in peer guided learning and scale environments. Um, my hunch is many of you can think of a hobby community that you're part of, a, a gaming community, how people learn to do their hair, do their makeup. There's all these really neat sort of peer learning networks online um, and people find them really powerful out of school and they tend to not mesh very well with school systems. Uh, when you take the scratch programming language and community and you bring it into schools, um, teachers have a really hard time using it as an open networked peer learning environment, and they sort of force it to become an instrument of direct instruction. 
Um, so, you know, each of these genres has some places where they really shine, but none of them is transforming the education system. You know, my hope in reading the book is that it, people could, you know, a department head and, and, and assistant provost could look at new technologies coming along and say, oh, this new thing is actually a variant on one of these three categories. And we know something about how these three categories perform and where they work well, where they don't. Um, and, uh, you know, you start to use that to figure out how a new tool might or might not incrementally improve what teaching and learning looks like. Now, if we really want new technologies to be better than what we've done in the past, we have to think about sort of what are the consistent dilemmas and obstacles that technologists, that technology implementers, that systems designers run into when they build new technologies. And I'd argue there are sort of four as yet intractable dilemmas um, that bedevil education technology designers and users. Um, the first is the curse of the familiar. Um, this is the idea that if you make a technology that's really familiar to folks, um, you can get a lot of adoption. You know, one of the most widely used education technology tools in the world is Quizlet, um, developed by an MIT dropout, and it basically makes online flashcards. Um, you know, something like half of all high school students in the United States every month use Quizlet. But slightly faster, more efficient flashcards is not going to transform the educational system. It's going to make the things that we already do like a little bit more efficient. So you can build things that people know and they'll use them, but it won't make that much of a difference. If you build things that ask people to learn in really different kinds of ways that could potentially be transformative educational systems, they often confuse people. So there are all these tools that facilitate peer learning communities or you know, independent algorithmic optimized learning or all these other kinds of things. And, and if they're too different from the normal routines of schools, then folks find them pretty hard. Um, a second as yet intractable dilemma is the EdTech Matthew effect. The idea that we often hope that new technologies will disproportionately benefit low income learners, but they typically disproportionately benefit the affluent. Um, there's all kinds of evidence that supports that, and there's not a lot of good design principles for figuring out how you would design against that. There's some pretty neat case studies of things, um, things like, uh, you know, from your colleagues at Rice University, uh, OpenStax textbooks, um, these free, openly licensed uh, online textbooks for the 25 most enrolled courses in the United States, you know, a really neat example of a project that I think uh, um, does good teaching and learning and disproportionately benefits low-income students, um, but there aren't a lot of examples that you could point to that are like that. The trap of routine assessment is this challenge that um, computers are really good at assessing things that are highly structured, that are routine, Computers are good at assessing the kinds of things computers are good at. Um, they're useful in, uh, um, you know, in computer programming. We have really good tools to evaluate like the engineering, you know, whether or not a computer program passes engineering challenges, whether or not it conforms to certain, um, uh, you know, sort of code layout criteria and things like that. Um, my colleague Hal Abelson at uh, MIT's Department of Computer Science once said that, uh, what code really is, is it's communication from one human to another human about methodology that should only incidentally be able to be run by machines. Um, if you believe that what code is, is, is communication about methodology, we don't have any automated tools um, that figure out whether or not code is written in such a way that it sort of describes to other people um, what it's doing and how it's doing it. Um, it. We don't have ways of evaluating whether or not code is well set up um, to you know, address technical debt, to be used collaboratively across multiple programmers and other kinds of things like that. Some of the most important things engineers do, we actually don't have tools to assess. Um, if we have computers that are really good assessing the kinds of things computers can do, the flip side is um, we don't have really good tools to assess the kinds of things that we need humans to do. Um, if there are things that computers need to do, we don't need to teach people how to do that stuff anymore. We need to teach humans how to do the things computers can't do. And that's where our assessment tools fall flat. So in a sense, to the degree to which we use automated assessments in our education technology, in our, in our educational systems, we use them to assess the kinds of things that we don't need people to do anymore. Um, and there's all kinds of space for interesting innovation to get better alignment between what we can assess and what we want students to learn. And then an incredible thing, the toxic power of data and experiments, 
you know, the, the way that, that consumer education, uh, consumer technology platforms get better, Amazon, Apple, Facebook, all these kinds of things is that they're sort of constantly testing people. They're, con they're collecting all kinds of data about what we do. And they use, you know, day after day of lots of little tests to improve what they're doing. Um, that, that powerful capacity exists in education technology tools. But if you go to parents and say, hey, we wanna use these education technology systems to experiment on your children, it turns out the phrase experiment on your children, while as a researcher, I find that kind of exciting. Um, not many of my fellow parents agree with me. Um, there's all kinds of cool things we can do in, learn in learning analytics and so forth. If we uh, collect all kinds of data about every single action that students take in a learning platform, but there are also real reasons to be concerned. We don't want schools that induct people into a lifetime of surveillance. Um, and so figuring out how we balance the kind of power of data and experiments with some of the real risks they have uh, to, to civil society, to trust between schools and other entities are, are challenges to be taken on. So those sort of four as yet intractable dilemmas are, uh, are, are four of the biggest challenges um, that, that, I, that, I, that I think we face and that I would encourage education technology developers, researchers to think about as they, as they tackle their new projects. Um, these are some other things. I think I'll pass on those um, just to, to bring it to a close. I mean, you know, the, the, the two really key pieces of the book are, are this idea that it's a celebration of the tinkering mindset, that the technology is not going to, if it's going to improve at schools at all, it's not going to improve it through disruption. It's not going to improve it through sweeping away the past. It's going to improve it through incremental improvements. And those incremental improvements, most importantly, will be guided by people. Our technology tools are only as powerful as the communities that support their use. Um, there's all kinds of urgent reasons to believe that we need to do a better job serving this generation of students whose lives are gonna be forever impacted by the pandemic. We're not gonna make those big improvements by downloading more apps onto their iPads and telling them to use them. Um, we're gonna, to the extent that those apps will be helpful at all, um, it's because we build the capacity of teachers, of educators, of students, of other folks to make use of them. Um, so with that, I'll pause. Um, I saw a few uh, things coming up in the chat. Um, and uh, I'm happy to just talk straight from those or, or, or Julie, if others, if you want to facilitate any kind of q and I'm, I'm happy to have people raise their hands and ask some questions or, or, or what, are, what are the norms here? Um, I am happy and was planning on facilitating Q&A to make it a little easier on you. I know it can be hard to go back and forth from the chat. So I'm happy to do that. Or if folks want to raise their hands, however you want to share it. There are some really interesting comments in the chat. Um, if we wanted to go back to that and start from there, one I wanted to highlight was this is um, Dr. Fauché made a comment about scaling. Technologies are almost never designed to scale. Why do we insist on designing ed tech apps so they require multi-day workshops? Right. Um, yeah, you, you know, for things to be useful, I, I've, I've some sympathy to the fact that we need training associated with education technologies because what you know, part of what I've said is we know that if we just give technology tools to teachers, they will use them to extend existing practices, to do the kinds of things that they were just doing before. And, you know, it's unlikely that, that ed tech tools will be helpful in that way. So they probably need some kind of training, support, other sorts of things to go along with it. Um, you know, part of what I talk about in the book is that I think many education technologies sort of think of scale the wrong way. Um, they think of scale as distributing new tools or resources more widely. You know, if we just put as many Khan Academy videos up on YouTube, then that's what scale looks like. And there's sort of a form of scale there, but it's a form that doesn't lead to a lot of change. Um, on the other hand, I'm interested in approaches that say, um, how do we how do we scale through community? Um, you know, the I, I think the Scratch programming language is a great example of this. Like Scratch is a really particular way that they want people to learn about creative computing. And most of the time when Scratch gets into schools, it's used in this sort of direct instruction checklist kind of way. You know, in, in a sense, teachers find a way to use Scratch in exactly the opposite way that their designers intended. 
Um, so what they have to do is they have to build this global network of educators that connect with one another and show them how to take advantage of these new tools sort of in the ways that they're intended, that you, you pretty much have to sort of give people a, a primer on the pedagogy of constructionism before they can pick up scratch and use it uh, kind of, you know, in the way it was intended. Um, there's another community that I really like as an example. Some of you may be familiar with the Desmos app. Um, which is used in mathematics. This, it has a sort of neat design in the sense that on, 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 at its face, it's just a graphing calculator. Just It's an online free graphing calculator that replaces a TI-82. And so there's a very familiar place where people can enter into Desmos. As you get to know more about Desmos, there's all kinds of really cool things that you can do with it, um, including... Uh, 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 you know, all kinds of mathematical modeling and other sorts of teaching and learning that way. So there's sort of a familiar place to start, but then there's, all, you know, all these networks of math educators that, that teach folks how to use Desmos, not just as a graphing calculator, but as a way um, for students, you know, young people to test their intuitions about mathematical relationships and demonstrate those, those intuitions vis visually. Um, so uh, um, that's, that's part of how I think about those, those challenges of of, of scaling community rather than scaling distribution. I hope others will jump in with questions, but I have one for you if folks want to take a minute to type or raise their hands. And it's this, is if you could wave your magic wand and affect one change in the US educational system, what would it be? Um, I mean, well, so, so a thing that we're thinking about a lot right now, um, I, I have two things that are sort of more on the urgent end of things. So teachers are completely overwhelmed. Um, if, if, if teachers are sort of on the verge of breakdown, they cannot improve and we're not going to get better results if they can improve. So part of what we need to figure out actually is like, how do we make there be less things that teachers need to do? If we've added so much to the job that it's become impossible, and part of the challenges that schools, school leaders, district leaders face now is looking at the educational system and saying, what is it that we can't do? Because anything that I might imagine that's additive um, is just going to be added on top of an already impossible position. And so um, I, actually, my, my, we have this podcast called the Teach Lab Podcast. We're trying to put together this uh, um, series for it called Subtraction in Action, where we try to find um, school leaders who have strategically found ways to tighten the curriculum, to narrow the curriculum, to be more focused, to reduce responsibilities, to reduce bureaucracy so teachers can focus on, on what's more important. The second thing I would hope the education system works on, you know, that I think was again very clearly demonstrated, and this is linked to that, um, the, the educational system cannot be this, the entirety of the social safety net that we have for young people in the United States. Um, when schools shut down, schools still had to be the place where students found a safe place to go, where students got fed, where students got healthcare screening, where students got mental health care screening. Schools can't do all that and do teaching and learning. Um, there need to be other institutions and in states and municipalities that provide a robust um, you know, social welfare state for students and their families so that schools can focus on what they're doing. I mean, even to some extent, you know, it's kind of intuitive in the United States that you have schools be the people that distribute technology to students, but it's not clear to me that makes sense. There's no reason to think that schools should be good at like supply chain management. You know, they, they can barely keep track of how many textbooks they have. And now you want them to like, you know, make internet accessible to families. You know, in the, United, in, in the 20th century, when we thought every home ought to have a connection to electricity, we didn't go to local school principals and say, well, you're going to have to build some telephone poles and get some wiring out to those, you know, rural families. No, we like built the rural electrification administration. Um, it doesn't make sense to, to do, you know, to ask superintendents to roll fiber optic cable for broadband up the holler. Um, the, uh, another question that I thought was great from Hee-Jun was about motivation. Um, I found that motivated students usually do well online, offline. However, students with less motivation show worse performance online than offline. I think that's a good intuition. You know, the only thing that I would caution a little bit about is that sometimes what looks to us as educators is motivation um, is really about context. Um, so there's all this stuff about sort of people's ability to do self-regulated learning. Um, we did this neat study of people who are in a, a, a an online program about supply chain management. And uh, 
um, as, as people, like it had a series of courses that went to an exam, that went to an in-person component, um, and the program got more mail over time. And we sort of asked people how they went about um, doing the program. And they said, well, I, you know, I, I snuck out uh, from work at lunch, or I stayed up late at night, or I, you know, spent my weekends working on the program. I just kind of made time for it wherever I could. And on, the, on one hand, you know, a, a good learning psychologist might define that as really effective self-regulation, um, but, but a sociologist might describe it as shirking family responsibilities. Like one of the way, you know, one of the ways that you get good at doing online school is shirking family responsibilities. Well, in our culture, it's a lot easier for men to shirk family responsibilities than for women. So some of the things that sort of look like motivation um, can actually be sort of the ability to push out things to the boundaries of their life. Um, and there, you know, there's some cultural ways that men can push out those family responsibilities more than women. Um, any way to use technology to motivate students, though, I think those strategies, you know, and, and we've tried a bunch of them in some really large scale studies are in large respects, not nearly as effective as using humans to motivate students. So if you look at the programs that build these huge uh, online communities of learners, Arizona State University, Western Governors University, Southern New Hampshire University, they have huge investments in human coaches, in 24-hour hotlines, in teaching assistants and advisors. They have all kinds of people whose job it is to support the people that are trying to do distance and remote learning. Um, so again, you know, the sort of paradox that there's lots of ways we can use technology to do distance learning. It can work into people's busy schedules, but there's a real challenge that many, many people find learning at a distance um, because it lacks that human dimension. And so part of what really good programs do is they build back in that human dimension. That's a great question, Heejun. Jun. question. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, I was just looking at Sean's question. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons why language learning teaching technology works better among kids as compared to adults. I, I, it might be interesting to hear more about that question. I, I, I'm not, you know, certainly young people are just, have certain qualities that make them better at language acquisition um, uh, uh, period. There, I, think, I think there's often a sense that, um, that young people, you know, are digital natives or something like that, are better at using technology than others. A lot of research on this suggests that actually young people are are not particularly better than older folks. You know, age is not a good predictor of somebody's technology fluency. It's particularly not a good predictor of their fluency with learning technologies. Um, that uh, you know, young people who are really good at you know messaging and taking photos and social networks and um, you know looking stuff online, some things like that can be really not good um, at, at at using Canvas, at, at using uh, the the kinds of learning technologies uh, um, uh, that we use. So um, there might be some specific context that that Sean has in mind, but I'd be I'd be I'd caution thinking that young people have a particular advantage, um, especially with learning technologies. I think young people need as much support and guidance as, as, as all kinds of other folks do. I certainly know that to be the case. Um, I've done a lot of work with helping teachers uh, use technology more effectively in their classroom, especially K-12 teachers. And there's often this bias that like, well, the younger folks are going to be better at that. You know, sometimes they are. Um, but a lot of times not. And a lot of times, actually, what older folks bring to bear is if you have a real mastery of pedagogy, if you have a mastery of the try, kind of thing you're trying to do with technology, um, then, then that can help you uh, um, know how to leverage the technology that you do have to, to meet your learning goals. I will second that by pointing out how much it surprises me that every time we ask students to turn in a screen grab, they take a picture of their laptop screen with their phone. There, there are, you know, there, there are, there's no standards and there's no infrastructure for people to learn the very basics mm -hmm. of operating a computer. There, you know, Google has this evidence that something like 80% of people, 90% of people don't know that you can use control F to search within a web page. <laughs> and to, to me, that is like just like an absolutely essential thing to function as a human. And it's quite possible the majority of Americans don't know how to do it. We have this other project that we're doing right now that some of you might be interested in. Um, it's with some partners at Stanford. I'll give you their website instead of ours um, called uh, Civic Online Reasoning. There's, there's really good evidence that all kinds of people across the United States are really not very good at searching online and sorting truth from fiction. Um, uh, these guys have done tests with middle school students who are really bad at it. They've also done tests with Stanford freshmen 
who are really bad at it. Um, they've also done tests with like award-winning tenured historians whose only job is to make sense of information, and they're not very good at evaluating online sources. Um, the one group of people that they studied who are really good at evaluating uh, online sources and sort of truth from fiction are fact checkers um, mm -hmm. from the nation's leading uh, uh, magazines and newspapers. And it was not because they're, you know, they're not smarter than Stanford freshmen. They're certainly not smarter than award-winning tenure historians. They just do things differently. When you watch a Stanford freshman go to an unfamiliar, you know, go to minimumwage.com and evaluate whether or not it's credible. You see them scrolling up and down. You see them going through these checklists. You sometimes see like on library sites, you know, is it a .com versus a .gov? Is it, um, you know, does it have citations? Does it look right? All these kinds of things. When you watch fact checkers go to a website, within seconds, they get off the page. So you, when we send fact checkers to minimumwage.com, they look around and they quickly notice that it's by this group called Employment Policies Institute. They do a Google search for Employment Policies Institute. They go, they open a bunch of tabs, but they usually first go to the Wikipedia page. People say, oh, Wikipedia is terrible. Not to these fact checkers. They use it on virtually every search they do. Um, and Employment Policies Institute is uh, run by this guy named Richard Berman, who's a PR flack for the restaurant industry. Um, and so it becomes obvious then that minimumwage.com is not, you know, a neutral source of information about the minimum wage. Um, but is uh, developed by a PR firm with a vested interest in keeping um, uh, 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 wages low. Um, so part of, part of what we're trying to figure out is like, all right, it looks like um, virtually no one in the United States has the, 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 knows the skills that the best people searching online use to sort truth from fiction. And so how can we, you know, in the next five years, teach 3.5 million teachers how to do that? How do we help the next, you know, the 57 million kids who are currently enrolled in schools get better at these kinds of things and so forth? Um, good. Well, we're, we're coming up towards the top of the hour. So maybe I'll just yeah. do uh, one more question or one more comment from folks and we can leave a few minutes early so people can have a couple minutes to transition to their next thing. This is Mike, yeah, maybe I can just make a comment. So uh, Justin, thanks for the, I think this was an outstanding presentation. And one of the questions I had in there was, um, I hope we'll be able to share this widely with people that were not able to be here to, to hear this. Please, please. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I just wanna say thanks so much. It's a pleasure, Mike. No, thank you all for having me. Um, and, and thank you all for uh, training up Julie so well and, and sharing her with us um, so she can help us with all the, the really important work that, that uh, she and her team are doing. Um, but yeah, you're more than welcome to share this talk. There's a link to the book, failure to disrupt.com. It's coming out in paperback uh, this summer, so you can assign it more cheaply to all of your sections. Um, and then on the Teach Lab podcast, we did a, a, a podcast series around it where we did 10 episodes where we talked to a whole bunch of different experts, one per each chapter. Um, and so if you're, if you're looking for other free resources to be able to share around that, uh, please do so. Um, but again, I wish you uh, all the very best. Thanks for spending uh, your lunch hour on Friday with me. Um, and uh, I hope everybody has a really wonderful afternoon. <laughs>